Well, I'll love for some of us, right? <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> First Thessalonians chapter 1 tonight, if you turn back there with us. There's something on my heart that kind of jumped out at me as I prepared for the message this morning. Uh, we'll be looking at tonight. Is that all right? Amen. First Thessalonians chapter 1. We're going to just go ahead and look at the rest of the chapter. Verse 6 through verse 10. Now I'm going to preach so long on one verse this morning. Don't let this scare you. So we're going to look at 5 tonight, okay? <laughs> verse 6. Hey, hey, you might have read this. Somebody shared this with me on Facebook about a, a preacher that um, got up to preach and he, and he usually preached about 20 minutes. And he got up to preach, and after about 10 minutes, he said, well, I, I, I'm going to have to close right here. My dog ate the rest of my notes. <laughs> and, he and so he just missed the service down in the back and laid it visit the church. He said, if your dog ever has puppies, let me know. I'm going to buy my pastor's one. <laughs> <laughs> Verse 6. Then you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. So that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Father, we pray that you help us tonight just to hear your word and apply it to our hearts. Let it speak. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're talking there in verse 5 this morning, and I'll read verse 5 again. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and the Holy Ghost and much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And then picking up where we start there in verse 6. We talked about the gospel this morning. Tonight, I want to look at these next few verses and think about the gospel effect, or the effect of the gospel. Because what Paul continues on and says is now that you have this gospel that we preached this morning, our gospel that he talked about, this is now the effect that it had on people. I still believe that the gospel can affect people. I still believe the Word of God has the power to change people's lives. And I thank God for that. And that's why we put so much emphasis on it around here, on the Word of God. Because it's, it's our foundation. We can build on a lot of fronts. But if we don't build on what God gives us to build on, we're going to crumble. Remember he said that that house that was built on the sand, when the wind and the floods came, that it fell, and mighty was the fall, or great was the fall thereof. I don't want to fall. I want to stand. Amen? Especially when temptation comes and when trial comes. I want to be able to stand. It doesn't mean we're going to stand strong. Sometimes we just barely stand. But if we're planted where we're supposed to be planted, we'll stand. And so that's what we want to do. The effect of the gospel, uh, is, as we see in this text, as we go on here in verse 6 through verse 10, is pretty incredible in how it affected these people. And that's kind of what Paul brings out of these next few verses, is the effect that the gospel had on this group or on this church or this body of believers. In verse 6 through verse 7, he talks about their walk. And I want you to know, one of the first things that will dramatically change in your life when you've been in, impacted by the gospel is your walk. Things that don't change in your life. Things that you do, things that you say, places that you go are changed when you are encountered with the gospel. When God speaks, He changes your heart. That's why Paul said, that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, everything's become new. So if we are, in fact, encountered or, or taken on by the gospel, things are going to change in our life, and there's going to be a new walk. And what's in, 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 incredible, I guess, uh, as we said, is this, this what Paul is noticing or observing or seeing in this group of people that they delivered the gospel to. There's nothing greater. And I look even in here tonight at people who have been saved over these last couple of years and you don't know what you mean to me to see you letting God affect your life and impact your life. And many others who have been here for years to have God save you at whatever age you were saved to be in here and be serving and be faithful to the Lord. That's what it's about. That's what it's about, is staying faithful. Anybody can show up on a big Sunday, right? 
Anybody think I saw a thing today that, that, that said last Sunday was the empty tomb, this Sunday was the empty pew? Amen? <laughs> Anybody can show up and we will never, ever, 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 ever take shots at people who show up because we want them here if they don't come on one Sunday. I want them here. Amen? So we're never going to mess with them about coming. We want them here. We want to love them and preach to them. But it's amazing when God gets a hold of it. You, won't, you can't get enough. And you want to be there because things are dramatically altered in your life. And all of a sudden, this word becomes a priority in everything that you do and everything that you are. And you've got to have it. And you want it. And that, that is one of the greatest places to be. And so thank you for being faithful to the word Paul talks about their walk and how their walk was and how the things that took place in their life and changed. He says in verse 6, you became followers of us and the Lord. And Paul, I believe, without even intending to, speaks very highly of, of the testimony of him and those who walked with him. Because if by following them, they follow the Lord. May it be said of us that if people follow the lead of our church, that we'll be following the Lord. That through following us, they'll find their way in behind the Lord and be able to follow the Lord and do what the Lord wants them to do. Their walk is that they were walking with the Lord. And you see a few areas as far as the walk is concerned that Paul talks about in verse 6 and also in verse 7 is very important. And it's three phases of all of our walks tonight. If you're going to walk with God, have a walk with God. It's not going to always be easy. It's not going to always be uh, uh, joyful. It's going to come with some, with some scars sometimes. But you're going to have to have this, and that's the same thing that he commended them for. And that's first of all that you're going to have to have trust. you got to have trust to follow somebody. And they followed Paul and they followed the Lord. And if we're going to have a walk that's worth repeating, a walk that's worth sharing, a walk that's going to be effective in our community, in our families, in our homes, and among the people that we've been called to minister to, we're going to have to have a walk that's built on trust. A walk that's built on trust in the Lord. I, I hope we can say tonight that we have trust in our leadership. As a church, I hope that that's our testimony. That we, not, not, not the infallibility, but at least the good intention, right? That we're going to at least do our best. And that might not even be perfect. We're going to try our best to say where God wants us to be. And so we trust our leadership and we trust the Lord and we try to follow and do the things that the Lord wants us to do. And Paul speaks of them having trust, but there's another leg to that walk that we have that we forget about sometimes or oftentimes we overlook, but that's the trial. Now what you'll find in the scriptures in Acts chapter 17, this is when Paul and them come to Thessalonica. And when the moment came that they came to Thessalonica and preached the gospel, they were under extreme persecution. So much so that around verse 10 of Acts 17, you see that Paul had to be removed from their fellowship for fear of his life and for his own safety. Preaching the gospel. And so it was through that trial, Paul said, that the gospel was delivered to you. And that your walk has shown not only did you trust, but in your walk you endured trial. And he goes on there in verse 6 and he makes that statement. And you became follower of, of us and of the Lord, having received the word of the Lord in much affliction. Having received the word of the Lord, even when it was tough and when it was hard and when it was tumultuous in your life, you were able to receive the word of the Lord and take on the word of the Lord and you're walking close before you now. And he speaks of that much affliction. And I notice the triumph in verse 6 and verse 7. This is the third leg of that walk. You know, y'all, we walk three legs, right? <laughs> And so he talked about that trust and that triumph, that triumph in the end of verse 6 and also verse 7, with much joy of the Holy Ghost. Joy of the Holy Ghost supersedes happiness. Happiness is up, happiness is down, happiness come, happiness go. But joy is not necessarily giddiness or gladness or smiling or happiness, but joy, I believe, it is just that resolve in our heart that brings peace, even in the midst of the storm, that no matter what happens, I know I'm okay because I'm hanging on to an unchanging hand. That I'm anchored in Almighty God, and no matter what takes place in my life, I'm going to receive His Word, and as Job said, though He slay me, I'm going to trust Him. I'm just going to believe God in His Word because He's God, and I'm His, and no matter what happens in this life, I can trust God because He's God, and He is good. Amen. And so we can depend on God, and we can trust the Lord. And in their walk, He saw that trust. He saw them endure that trial, though they received the Word in affliction, but that joy of the Holy Ghost, that triumph, Triumph is being able to celebrate in the midst of the storm. It's being able to look around tonight in the United States of America at the apathy that's in the church and at the sin and the wild uh, things that are going on in the world all around us and be able to say, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, and just believe God and hang on. <laughs> do what God's called us to do. He goes on in verse 7, seeing that triumph, and says, so that you were insane. To all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. 
What an encouragement to think about. That their triumph was not only that they received the word of the Lord in affliction, not only did they endure the trial of being able to in affliction find joy in the Holy Ghost, but in the midst of all of that, they were able to be a minister or a testimony to other people. That we never realize that when we're going through or enduring what God's put in our lives, that there are other people we're ministering to in the process. And when we as a church go through things together, and when we as a family go through things together, or sometimes in our marriages we go through things, or raising our kids we go through things. Man, one thing I have learned about life is everybody's detail is different. Nobody has the same story. Every family, every couple, every relationship has its own unique set of trials and circumstances, each one unique to them. And I have people share problems with me sometimes, and they'll try to, try to apologize to me because their problems are not as bad as other people's problems. And I always stop them, and I always almost rebuke them and tell them, I know your problem might not seem as big as their problem, but your problem is your problem. And we've got to deal with your problem, right? We'll never address it until we call it what it is. And I don't care where it goes on the scale of what the world might think. When I got trouble, I got trouble. Right? Amen. And so we want to help people. No matter what it is or where they are, we want to help those people. I just think it's interesting that in the midst of their trial and much affliction, that they receive the word of the Lord. Talking about their walk. The effect of the gospel. That in their walk, the effect of the gospel was this. That they persevered through trial. And they triumphed in the sense that they had the joy of the Holy Ghost and they were examples to other people of how we ought to walk in this world. Is there anything we can beg more as a church? They, they were examples because they suffered persecution. We wouldn't want to suffer persecution. But it was by that persecution that God used them to bring glory to His name and use them to be an example to other people. Nobody wants to suffer. Nobody wants to go through heartache. But God can use every detail of everything in our lives to bring glory to Himself and to use us to be ministers to other people, which is what we've been called to do and called to be. So in the effect of the gospel, He talks about their walk in verse 6 and verse 7. In verse 8, Paul talks about their word. Is there anything that should be more appreciated as a testimony of any church, especially our church, or whatever church we would belong to, or be a part of, or help be a part of, or anything along those lines. Then to be able to be said is this right here. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord. I, I wish that would be, if, if when the day comes and the trumpet sounds, and we're all gone, and they put a headstone up for the Antioch Baptist Church. May that be our epitaph. Right? From you sounded out the word of the Lord. That would be enough. That would be enough to sum up. If that could be our testimony of 117 years, that it could be said that from this church was sounded out the word of the Lord. I love sometimes to go over to the cemetery and go back there to that old place where the old church was. And that monument that's back there. And think about where that, that's very close, I was told, to where the old pulpit was. And the old church and the rocks that are around the, the the thing, the monument, the granite monument, and the rocks that are around that were from the chimney of the house of the first pastor. And I just think that's, that, that kind of stuff just gives me chill bumps. I don't know, I'm weird like that. But I just love to go over there and think about the history of our church and, and the testimony of our church. And kind of like the old song says, too many dangers, toils, and snares have already come in that grace that brought us safe this far. That same grace has bring us home. May it be said when the dying day comes. The day, and I know there's not going to really be a cemetery for churches. Don't, don't. Go out here saying what I didn't say. But when the dying day came, if they set up the monument, would our epitaph be that we sounded out the word of the Lord? I would hope so. I hope that that would be our, our intention as a church and as a people. I thought that was a great testimony that he shared. Not only about their walk, but about their word, their, their effort in sounding out the word of the Lord. He says there in verse 8, Far from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God is spread abroad. I thought there, there, there is a missionary line in there like very few you'll ever read or ever hear. And that is, though our, our desire and our call is to share the gospel around the world and to every creed and to every nation and to every culture, what our, our effort is toward and our faith is toward and what we do is for God. And, and though wherever that carries us, is where we want to be. But I just thought that it was interesting that Paul said that your, your word sounded out in these areas. But the important part is, is that it sounded out faithfully everywhere to Godward that your faith was spread. 
And that means more than just where you and I can go. Just like with Brother Charlie or other missionaries that we send money to or support. There are places in this world you and I will never get to go and share the gospel. But there are those that are already there and those that are going that we can be a part of their ministry. Thank God for all the things that we do. But remember that our commission is to spread the gospel to every creature. Our job tonight is to share the gospel with every creature. Our job is to declare the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our job. And there are those we can share it with personally. But there are those that we can get behind and be a blessing to that are going elsewhere into the uttermost parts of the world to share the gospel. And I just thought it was interesting that Paul said that, that their faith went beyond where their reputation was. That everywhere that their faith was, that's where God was. And he says there in verse 8, again, I, I've said it wrong about five times, but we'll be sure to say it right. But also in every place your faith to God were to spread their all so that we need not to speak anything. Not just their effort, but their faith. And their effect is that Paul says we're getting to places where y'all have already reached and they've already heard everything that we can tell them. We're getting to places that your ministry has touched and they've already heard the gospel. Could there be anything greater to a church planet than Paul, who started and founded and was a, a, an integral part in the Thessalonican church, than to go into the mission field and hear the very word that he shared with them that had already been shared by those people? Is there anything greater as a minister of the gospel for him to be able to go here? To get to see the effect that they have had in, in, in preaching the gospel and in being that sounding board of the word of the Lord. That from you sounded out the word of the Lord. I heard a guy say one time that be a uh, testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ, use words if necessary. Well, that's like saying feed somebody and use food if necessary. We can share the gospel lifestyle evangelism, you can call it what you want to. We can live it all we want to. But if we don't have a message to go with that law, we're not going to help anybody. We're not going to give glory to the Lord with our footsteps. We're going to open our mouth and cry out and give praise to God. And let people know why we do what we do. There's no such thing as a good person. Not a just man in the world that does good to sit in not. I think we ought to live it. I think it ought to be echoed by the way we live and the way that we walk. But you understand that if our walk and talk do not go together, then we're going to be lacking in our effect on the people that we're trying to reach. We can walk it right all day long, but we've got to open our mouths and proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I just like that he used that term, even though he talked about their walk, that he said, you're a sound and more of the gospel. That from you sounded out the word of the Lord. Preach the word. Share the word. Preach the gospel. He talked about their walk in verse 6 and 7. He talked about their word in verse 8. And he talked about their witness in verse 9 and verse 10. He goes on down in verse 9. And he says, For they themselves show us, show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. Basically, they show us the effect that we had in you by the effect that you've had in them. <laughs> And how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. There are two things concerning two areas, I guess, in our witness that Paul addresses here. There's a couple of things that, that change in our lives. And one, verse 9, you see, is that they had an evident faith. An evident faith. That in their life, it was evident that they had faith. That they had turned, there was a, a obvious fruit of repentance. They had turned from their idols to serve the living God. That they had made an effort, they had made a change, they had made the proper necessary adjustments to be what God wanted them to be. And they had fled from their idols, they had slain their idols, and they had turned to God. And because of that, they had a faith that other people could see. I love when somebody says that they were, they were spurned by the Spirit to do something because of something they saw in somebody else's life. That they were able to witness the Lord in their life make such a change in them. There's a good friend of my brother's named Jim Spurlock. I don't know how many of you have ever heard or know Jim Spurlock. Probably nobody. He used to drive a race car. He had a sticker on his back glass that said, I follow no one but Jesus. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, he, uh, he, he came. We had the Bible filled with rest one time. And he came over there and he'd been driving a truck for Vic Gant. Some of you might know Vic. And he'd been driving a truck for Vic Gant and Vic Gant. All he could, he would, Vic wouldn't put the radio up. All he had was a tape player in there. And all he would leave in there for those truck drivers was preaching tape. For them to listen to the gospel all day. And so it was either listen to nothing or listen to these preachers. And so he's lying right there and listening to all these preachers. And then we were having a revival. Jim, me and our friend called me and he said, Hey, I heard you said a revival at church. I said, We are. 
He said, do you care if me and Kim come? I said, no, I'd love for you to come. Him and Kim came. That was in March 2007. Both got saved that night in revival. And it's just a witness of how somebody else had affected their life. And because of the effect that God had in somebody else's life, God was able to use that to affect their life. And I just love testimonies like that. And the evidence of faith in somebody's life. And this is why we preach that we ought to be sold out. This is why apathy drives preachers crazy. Because there are people in your life that need to see you sold out. There are people in your life that need to see you wide open for the Lord. And God knows our kids, our, our youth, and our young children all need to see mamas and daddies loving Jesus. They need to see mamas and daddies that have evidence in their life, evidence in their computer and internet history, that have evidence in their refrigerator, that have evidence in their TV guide, that have evidence in their magazine rack, that they love Jesus. And not just Sunday. But we're coming here and put on our church face. Walk around and love some Jesus, right? But to have an evident faith. Where we turn from our eyes. And we worship the true and living God. Not only an evident faith, but another area in our witness that says a lot about who we are to this world is our expected future. Isn't it nice to know today that we have an absolute guarantee home in heaven? That we as the people of God tonight, the worst thing that they do is kill us. And if they kill us, we're going to go home and be with Jesus. And that's why Paul said, if I live, it's going to be Christ living in me. And if I die, it's going to be gain. Because if I live, it's going to be Jesus. And if I die, I'm going to be with Jesus. So you can't win with a guy like that. You, what do you do to somebody like that? If you kill me, it's better than letting me live. And if you let me live, I'm going to drive you crazy until you kill me. And that's exactly what he did. He kept preaching and kept preaching and kept preaching. Reaching people, spreading the gospel, planting churches, doing what God called him to do. So they laid him on the chopping block and cut his head off for preaching the gospel. And he was happy. Finished his course. He kept the faith. He fought a good fight. Paul was satisfied with his lot. He did what God had called him to do. Because he knew that he had an unexpected future. He says there in verse 10, And to wait for his son from heaven. Whom he raised from the dead. There's another, another gleaning of the resurrection. Even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. That we've got peace. And we get to walk in peace. We get to walk with faith in a living God and a future in His home that we're a part of the family. We sing a song in invitation all the time about coming home. And I just love that. I love that thought of coming back into the fold as a, as a wayward child of God or coming to God as a lost person and coming into that relationship with God. It just illustrates in that song that, that it's as comfortable as just coming home and just coming back into the fold, coming back into that relationship. I, I'm going to go, me and Jessica, we're, for our 10-year anniversary, we're going to Broken Bow, Oklahoma. We don't hold back anything, right? <laughs> we're going to go up there in, in a few weeks and just hang out. We had our 10-year anniversary a couple weeks ago, and we were floating around in our house then, so we, <laughs> we decided to put it off for a little while. But, uh, we're going to go for a few days and just, just get away and hang out for a little while. But I'm going to go up there, and it's nice. We got, it's a cabin, and it's got all this stuff. You know what I mean? It's, it's fancy. It's going to be fun. It's going to be real fun. And, and it's just going to be something to do. It's going to be pretty and nice and all that. And you get there, and it's nice, but it's not home. And it's something that always fascinates me about head. Is I've, got, I've, been to, I've been to these places that are real pretty. I've been to these resorts. I've been to all kinds of fancy places. But it's something about coming home. I don't care if you live in a camper trailer. When you get home, that's home. You want to be home. It's nice to have a place to kick your shoes off, right? And you walk around and don't have to worry about anybody else's bare feet being on that floor with yours. And, you know what I mean? You don't have to worry about, you know, just weird stuff you think about when you're off in a hotel or whatever, you know? <laughs> And I just like to think about heaven one day. As great as it's going to be. And as awesome as it's going to be. And the, the, the glory of the Lord that's going to be there. As a child of God, it's just going to be a homecoming. And we're going to get into heaven and we're not we're going to be overwhelmed by the glory of God. And reunited with family and, and, and friends and parents and loved ones and spouses and children and all these that we've lost. And as great as all that's going to be, it, it, it could be almost in our minds built up like this vacation or this resort or this paradise. And though I know it is, I think the greatest joy about that to me is knowing that in all of its splendor, it's going to be home. That I'm going to be comfortable and I'm going to be home. I, I'm not going to be in that foreign resort and, and enjoy all the beauty of it like a, like a tourist. But I'm going to be home. 
And I'm going to be more comfortable there than I am here. And as we talk about that rich man, Isaac, that Lazarus was comforted in Abraham's bosom. And that word bosom means in his seat of affection. The world we the very love of God that embraces us and gets us through this, this temporal life is the love of God that's going to be able to encapsulate us because we'll be separated from the sinful flesh and for once in our life we'll be pure, we'll be free, we'll be separate from sin and be in the lap of the Lord Jesus Christ and be in the seat of His affection. That's home. That's home. We've got a future home. We've got a place to go. And so we can get as wrapped up in this world as we want to. It's a temporary abode. It's just a pilgrim passing through with going home. home. And I'm proud of that. Amen? Amen. Got a home in glory land that I've shown. So if you need to be saved tonight, y'all can be saved tonight. I put it to you like that. If there's anything else you need to come to the altar and settle tonight, we can give you the invitation to do that. But all of that to say, back to the title of the message tonight, is the gospel should have an effect on our lives. And it should affect the way we walk. It should affect the word that we sound forth. And it should affect our witness. In the sense that we have a faith and we know and we live our lives conscious of our future because we're a child of God. Amen. Altars of the Stand with us as we sing. Our Father, we love you tonight and we thank you so much for your word. God, I do pray as we open this altar, if there's one here tonight that needs to get some settled, that they get it settled tonight. Lord, we thank you for the gospel, what it means to each of us. Even the thought that terrifies us as we think about what we'd be or where we'd be without. But because you love us, we've got that gospel message. And we cling to it tonight. We cling to it for hope in our own lives. God, as we know it's the only thing in our life that will endure. Lord, we cling to it for hope as we look to our families and wonder sometimes and worry and fear that we don't know what they're going to do or what this world is going to do to them or what they'll be able to do in this world. And God, we know because of the gospel that there's hope. So we pray that you help us to find joy in the Holy Ghost in the gospel message. Bless this invitation tonight. Accomplish your will. We're going to thank you either way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.